the work that we've done in the past together has really tried to say what policymakers are concerned about is the economy. And if we can then think about impacts of air pollution on the economy as a percentage of GDP, that really gets a lot of people's attention. I'm Noelle Celine. I'm associate professor in the Institute for Data Systems and Society and also the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. My research relates to air pollution, thinking about decision making and how air pollution travels in the environment and what health impacts that that air pollution has. I'm John Riley. I'm a senior lecturer in the Sloan School. Uh, That's where my appointment is. And I also am co-director of the Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. I work on environmental, agriculture and energy economics. So that's what I've been doing and and working on climate change for most of my career, which is now almost 40 years. I'm not sure I really have an updated picture of what the energy mix actually is from a statistics point of view. Why don't we start with that and talk about what actually is happening now in the U.S.? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start, Noel. You know, I think there's a lot of talk about you know, wind and solar power, and there's been a lot of investment in wind and solar. But as of 2018, we still relied on fossil fuels for 80% of our energy, So, and another 9% from nuclear power. So there's only 11% from renewables. And of that, half of that is hydro and geothermal. Another almost quarter is biomass. So of those renewables, only about 25% is from wind and solar. So that makes them contributing less than 3% of our current energy needs. So as we look forward, if we think we're going to rely on those more and get rid of fossil fuels, they have to grow a lot. But that differs a lot by region, right? Because that's in the average of the U.S. But here in Massachusetts, that's different from, for example, California or the Northwest, right? Oh, sure. In general, California has almost no coal, I think has virtually no coal electricity generation. Similarly, very little in New England, you know, A lot of the coal use in the United States is in the central part of the country. But again, the electricity markets are kind of overlapped. So just because you don't use the fuel in your region doesn't mean you're not necessarily responsible for the emissions in other regions, for example. And so when we think about the the solar and wind penetration, that's going to obviously vary as well, because some states have these renewable portfolio standards. Yeah, and but then also there's a market for renewable recs as well. So again, states can put in the renewable power, but it may be other states purchasing the recs. So even though there's regional differences, there are national markets in these things that it's hard to tell where the responsibility might lie. Of course, those states that put in the renewable portfolio standards then are creating a market for development for renewables somewhere. Well, that makes it interesting to think about both CO2 and air pollution at the same time, right? Because you have CO2 where it doesn't matter where you're emitting. And then when you're thinking about air pollution, uh, like particulate matter in the atmosphere, it matters where what kind of sulfur and nitrogen is emitted and where. So those two are really overlapping problems. And it makes it difficult to figure out what happens when you put in a renewable standard, for example. Oh, yeah. It makes it, well, it makes it incredibly different. And you know even more about that than I do, I think, Noel. I mean, one of my fascinating questions is, you know, you mentioned that link between air pollution and climate. And when I've talked to atmospheric chemists like yourself, I'm always amazed at how complex and how many those linkages are. Maybe you could, you know, remind me kind of what some of those things are. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about what happens from a power plant, I mean, let's say a coal-fired power plant, it's emitting not only CO2, but it's also emitting sulfur dioxide and it's emitting oxides of nitrogen. And those uh, emissions combine in the atmosphere and form particulate matter. So PM2.5 is made up of sulfur, nitrogen, and ammonium. And that creates an aerosol when we inhale it that is dangerous to human health. Um, But it depends whether you're downwind of that power plant or not, whether you're affected by that. So it matters a lot where that power plant is. So you say these particulate matter, you say they're composed of different things. Does it matter what they're composed of in terms of the health effect? Well, that's a big question, right? So the particulate matter we're most concerned with is the really small pieces. So less than two and a half microns in size. And that's the fraction that you can inhale really deeply into your lungs and causes health impacts. It's 
probably the case that different kinds of particulate matter have different health impacts, but it's really hard to tell. And there haven't been really good studies quantifying that relationship between the composition of particulate matter and the health effects. Well, it's one of the trends in the uh, one of the energy trends we have seen that has, we think, been a positive effect on CO2 emissions has been this big switch over the last decade away from coal and towards natural gas. Has that had a benefit in the conventional air pollutants that you're talking about? Oh, absolutely. When you think about the emissions that come from a gas plant, that's much less than comes from a coal plant. Uh, The more controls that you can put on and the less coal that's in the energy mix, the better it is for air pollution. Now, I know you've looked at mercury as well. Is mercury a particulate matter, or, is it, or what exactly is mer- how do how do how do we get exposed to mercury, and where does that come from in the energy system? Well, it primarily comes from coal in the energy system. Uh, it's a contaminant of coal, and when you burn coal, it emits mercury to the atmosphere. That mercury can be associated with particles, uh, but it also can be in the gas phase, and. We're actually not concerned with the concentrations of mercury that we inhale from, for example, an emitting power plant, but we're concerned with mercury when it deposits to ecosystems, converts to methylmercury, and then we eat fish that has high levels of methylmercury. But the root of that really is coal. You know, we've we've been worried about uh, climate change and CO2 emissions and other things, greenhouse gas emissions, but Some of the air pollutants have some effects on the climate as well directly, don't they? Yeah. So uh, black carbon, for example, can be a climate warmer. So the idea that you can potentially design strategies to mitigate CO2 and mitigate air pollution at the same time has been really attractive to policymakers. And one of the really attractive parts of that is that you can have local benefit as well as global benefits. One of the problems with dealing with the CO2 problem is that any actions that you take now, you might not see the impacts of in your local area or on a time scale that you're concerned with as a policymaker. But actions on air pollution can benefit people right away and nearby. Yeah, I guess, you know, we've both done some work in China. And I think there's a big debate, you know, China made some, you know, well, different arguments, whether it's a big commitment or a small commitment to reduce CO2 emissions, but I think there are some people that believe most of that interest was in reducing air pollution. So do they really get credit for reducing CO2 emissions or not if they're going to do it anyway for air pollution? But I guess in the bigger scheme of things, reducing it for whatever reason is a good thing. Uh, I mean, you've looked at China. Do you have any perspective on some of those issues? Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure whether you necessarily need the right reason as long as you have both impacts at the same time. And there's better or worse ways to do that. You can take actions that don't actually mitigate CO2 emissions. For example, putting in scrubbers might even increase CO2 emissions because it costs more energy to actually run those scrubbers. On the other hand, moving away from coal towards more renewables will have both benefit CO2 and air pollution. Yeah, I think we did a study some years ago with a kind of a simplified model. I know you've used some really complex ones where we ask if you put a policy on to reduce air pollution, conventional air pollutants like your particulate matter items in China, what effect would that have on CO2 emissions and vice versa? If you put a cap on CO2 emissions, what effect would that have on air pollution? And we kind of said, if you set a policy, you get a 10% reduction in air pollution. Does that give you a 10% reduction in CO2 emissions or a 1% reduction in CO2 emissions or what? What is this cross relationship? And surprisingly, we found it was almost one for one. So you, you get a reduction in both, even if you're only aiming for one. But there can be some benefits of doing both because there probably are some technologies that would reduce one set of pollutants and not the other. I think there's big concern in China about developing coal gasification and then using gas in the cities to reduce air pollution. But that coal gasification would have resulted in a lot of CO2 emissions out elsewhere. So that's where you don't get the double benefit. Yeah, I think we've both done work that has illustrated that double benefit at the levels of CO2 emissions and with the energy mix that we have now. The really interesting question, I think, is what happens when you start getting less and less CO2 um, and we, when you start reducing CO2 to the levels that are consistent with, for example, the two degree target, how do you really optimize those strategies to think about both air pollution and CO2 simultaneously? Yeah. Yeah. My sense is if we start hitting though, if we really have to hit those targets, air pollution from 
energy was largely going to be gone because you know if we if we really have to hit those two degree targets, then we have to get to essentially zero emissions of CO two, and if we're not using any of the fossil fuels, then there's not going to be any of the air pollutants associated with those combustion. I guess even if we're using something like carbon capture and storage, I think that technology in doing that, you remove all the other pollutants as well as the CO2. So that will kind of, I think, hope make the air pollution problem go away, at least from energy. But I can, that's one of the interesting things. I know we're involved in a joint project together with Harvard. And in the recent meeting we had, I was kind of struck by where some of the other pollutants, there are still other sources of some of those pollutants. Might you say a little bit about some of those? Yeah, well, I was going to bring up agriculture, which is one one area that you've worked in a lot, and the ammonia that helps make sulfate, nitrate, ammonium aerosols comes a lot from agriculture. Uh, so that kind of activity, which isn't a power plant, can contribute to air pollution also. Yeah, that's the route that really surprised me. I just <laughs> I wasn't wasn't expecting that. And so then sometimes, you know, when we start, you know, and I think the experience in California. Uh, really cleaning up power plants, which are the big source, and then cleaning up vehicles are quite a lot, are now left with things like charcoal grills and power boats and lawnmowers as the major sources of pollutant. And personal care products, too. Oh, so really? aerosols from things like deodorants and, you know, things with scents and various other kinds of cleaning products, um, that actually has a has a big impact. Some of the volatile organics from just other kinds of household sources. You know, it's kind of interesting because when we think about, as an economist, we want to put a carbon tax or a pollution tax across all the sources, and then we get reductions elsewhere. I think oftentimes, frequently, people say, well, what are the big sources? Let's just tackle those. Well, the issue is once you tackle those, then you're left with these little sources, which are now the big sources. And, you know, with the scale of humanity becoming bigger and bigger, more people, more economy, even those what were small things become big as we go forward. So it's a big challenge. Yeah. And and one of the things that's come out of our, our Harvard collaboration is the work that the Harvard School of Public Health has done in quantifying the impacts of air pollution, even at lower levels. There are a lot of places in the United States that are still in uh, compliance with air quality standards. But what the Harvard work has shown is that that actually still has health impacts. So we're going to be dealing with air pollution for a long time. And we could have some significant benefits even as we decarbonize the economy. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You probably know this history as well as I do. But when the Clean Air Act was written, you know, people thought there were safe levels of air pollution. And so the language is actually there can't be any impact on human health. But as we're finding, being able to detect the impacts of smaller and smaller levels, it's not clear that there is any level where it doesn't have some impact on human health. Yeah, and you have a bunch of different problems going on simultaneously with different timescales. For example, mercury stays in the environment for a long time. So when we talk about a particulate matter problem, if we shut everything off in a few days, things will settle out of the atmosphere. But with mercury, mercury continues to cycle between the atmosphere, land, and ocean. So mercury will continue to be a problem because it's an element. It doesn't go away. So mercury will continue to be a problem for generations. Yeah, when I first read your work on that, I was really struck by that. And that is really a challenging problem. It's a bit like the climate problem and long-lived greenhouse gases. Uh, once they're in the atmosphere, they're there for a long, long time. And so you're really stuck with them. And again, I think, you know, the, as you were talking about pollution effects on climate, there's, of course, the bright aerosols. The sulfate aerosols are kind of reflective. Um, and so they're currently offering kind of a cooling effect. But if we clean them up really quickly, that will unmask the already warming that's there. So there's these complex interactions are just constantly amazing me. Well, as a as an atmospheric chemist, I think a lot about the time scales of interactions, the temporal and spatial scales, but economists do too, right? So as we think about how policymakers value these near-term effects and long-term effects, economists have thought a lot about that question. Yeah, there we're, well, we're, you know, there's this whole discounting issue. You know, we think if you put money in the bank and can earn 4% on it, you should think about the future being, instead of spending money today for something that's going to only benefit you 50 years in the future, you can still put that money in the bank today and earn money and then, and then solve it when you get to the problem. So you don't have to solve it farther ahead than you really have to. But, you know, with the climate change thing, 
there is this idea that the risks are in really the distant future. That was true when I started working in the area 40 years ago, <laughs> but unfortunately it's 40 years later and we're actually seeing the effects now. And, and I think they may be bigger than we actually imagine. Another aspect of this problem that I think is really fascinating, and, and I know you've worked on this, and that's the uh, environmental justice angle of it. So can you t- you, I know you've done some work. Can you remind me of some of the results you've gotten on that? Yeah. So one of the things that's well known in, in the U.S. is that populations that are lower income, uh, populations that are minorities are highly exposed to air pollution and differentially exposed. So they're exposed to more air pollution. They see more impacts than others. And one of the things that, that our work showed was that the costs of this air pollution are also borne by low income people. And that was an important result because it says that if you mitigate air pollution, you actually can have an important impact on inequality. That's been the concern broadly, and you can, and some of it is kind of obvious. I mean, I guess, you know, wealthy neighborhoods prevent dirty industry from moving in, and poor neighborhoods, you know, don't have that political power, and so they get the location of this of these dirty sorts of things. So it's kind of a reinforcing circle that way, I guess. And so that's a really important thing as we go forward. I know when we look at the climate problem and solving it, you know, we realize that lower income households spend a bigger proportion of their income on energy. So if we think about having to make energy more expensive because we're moving to alternative forms that aren't as cheap, we really have to think about how we right the wrong of making of making poorer people disproportionately poorer to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, overall, wealthy people use more energy, but it's a smaller proportion of their income. So we have some ways of dealing with that, you know, taxing a carbon tax and then rebates back to poorer households. Well, I think that's one of the really strong things about economists and atmospheric scientists working together is that you can get a better sense of where the problems are, where possible solutions can be beneficial, and get a better idea of who benefits from these solutions, which hopefully will actually get policymakers to act on them. So we, we see these problems looming. We see, you know, we've made progress in air pollution over the past, but if we don't continue to get cleaner and cleaner, scale just keeps pushing us up. We have that problem. We have the climate problem. I mean, what's your perspective on where we need to be in a decade or two? I think we really need to pay attention to the kinds of decisions that people are making to benefit society, both in the near term and the long term, and really finding these solutions that are win-wins to think about how we can tackle the air pollution problem at the same time as tackling the climate change problem and not have solutions that will benefit us now in the near term, but sacrifice in the long term and really understand those linkages better. So I really view air pollution and climate as a case study example of a broad range of different kinds of sustainable development issues. If you think about, for example, the sustainable development goals of things like ending hunger and poverty, thinking about how you can benefit people in the near term without sacrificing the ability of future generations to live and thrive. Yeah, I guess, you know, we economists have been as guilty of this as anyone. And that's, you know, we've had trouble at times talking about what the exact benefits are. So we've talked about the cost of policies. And then it just looks like they're a lose situation uh, in the immediate term, people seeing more expensive energy and thinking maybe only about the long term solution. But I think we are now trying, well, you and I have worked on it a bit of trying to kind of bring these health benefits and the environmental benefits back into the whole economic modeling framework so we can say, well, look, there's some costs of changing the energy use, but there's a whole bunch of benefits over on this side of avoided health costs and avoided health effects. So the ideal there is to have it be a win situation. It's just, I guess, that if people go to the gasoline pump and see higher gasoline costs, they aren't automatically connecting that with cleaner air, but they should. I think it's the idea that historically, a lot of the framing has been more sacrificing in order to benefit future generations. But there are good reasons to benefit people who are here now. And we can understand better the benefits of clean energy sources. We can convince people that 
this is something that is in their interest as well as the interest of the future. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've been around a few more years than you, you know, Al, but I, you know, going back, you know, to my days in graduate school and environmental economics, I think there was a perception that the environment was a luxury good, that that was something that benefited, you know, wealthy people. But when we see the environment, uh, when we see problems like mercury affecting the IQ of children, and particularly of poor children, or we see climate change or ozone pollution damaging crops and limiting food availability and raising food prices, that's affecting poor people. So a good environment isn't a luxury good. It's actually a necessity good and actually probably has a bigger impact on the poor as your, as your environmental justice work has demonstrated, I think. And also increasingly, I think we're realizing the importance of the environment to really all sectors of the economy and how important having a stable climate is. And that wasn't really taken into account as much 40 years ago. Yeah, I think the big move now, um, and we're doing some work on this, is in um, climate finance and um, climate-related financial risk. So a lot of the big uh, banking institutions uh, are beginning to kind of, and Bank of England, others, are beginning to force banks to think about, are my loans and assets exposed to climate risk? Either because they're heavily invested in fossil fuels, which if we are no longer going to use them, aren't going to be worth very much, so that may tank those assets, or they have uh, big uh, loans in flood-prone areas, and a lot of homes and mortgages go underwater, both literally and figuratively. Uh, so so that sort of forcing the financial community to look at these risks, I think will begin to percolate the recognition that you need to take these into account throughout a lot of the economy, at least, well, maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but that's what I'm hoping. Well, I think you're increasingly seeing people planning for 10, 20 years ahead. And there are institutions, certainly, that plan on those timescales, MIT, for example, um, thinking about when our next generation of students are going to be at their 50th reunion is basically the class of 2020 will be at their 50th reunion in 2070. Now, when we think about 2070, we think about that a long way away, but we saw the 50th reunion crowd coming here to MIT this past June and it's easy to imagine that that would happen 50 years in the future for our current seniors. Yeah, well, I'm actually involved in a, a uh, effort at, with MIT and our uh, buildings folks to evaluate the risks of climate change to MIT. Uh, and so there's a big effort on the campus to, in the new buildings we're putting up, make sure that they're resilient to climate change. There's been lessons learned in in the Gulf, where climate change came in and damaged a whole bunch of stuff that was in the basement or on the first floor, and we're doing kind of an inventory at MIT. Does, do people have really unique and one-of-a-kind collections stored in the basement? Well, you should get it up out of the basement, because if that's flooded, then we've lost that collection completely. Are electrical connections and utilities and generators located on the ground floor, or can we move? do we have to move them up 10 or 12 feet so in case of flooding... They're resilient. And then if we have storm events, what does that do disrupt students and faculty to getting to campus? So I think we should have started thinking this far ahead 20 years ago, but now thinking ahead, we can make adjustments in the building scheme as we go. And usually it doesn't take that much more to build a resilient building, but if you build a building that isn't, to fix it takes a lot. So thinking ahead really helps. Yeah, and people do plan on those timescales. I mean, we talk about policymakers thinking maybe a year or two ahead, but when you're thinking about infrastructure, you're really hoping it lasts for 50 years. So we're going to have to massively transform the energy system. You know, essentially, fossil fuels have to go away, and we have to replace them with something else. You know, I know, you know, wind and solar are the popular ones now, but we really worry that, you know, I almost hate to say this anymore, but the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So we have to fill in the electricity needs in between. There's hope that there could be some storage technique, batteries or something that could store power. But that's still quite expensive and is likely to continue to be expensive. So I think we have to look for lots of different options. You know, nuclear, one hates to even talk about it because of all the nuclear waste issues, but maybe that's a place we can go. 
but it is a big challenge. But what about the role of behavioral changes? Do you think that our use of energy, in particular the timing and the frequency of it, could change as well? Well, as economists, we always figure the thing that changes behavior is price. So if we raise the price of fossil fuel things, then we can then that will change people's behavior. You know, I mean, I guess there's hope that somehow we'll become better <laughs> and more conscious. So there may be some hope of that. I think there are some big combined win-win situations. So if we bicycled more, we'd be in a little better health probably if there's not a lot of air pollution we're breathing in while we do it. Or if we ate a better diet with less saturated fat and red meat, cattle resulted in a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, we could maybe both solve the climate problem and have a, a healthier life. So there's possible things there. I think one of the things that gives me optimism is to think about how large a change there's been just within my lifetime on how we've used communications technology and thinking about how we use the telephone before mobile phones and how we use the telephone now. And it's just completely different. The the patterns of our lives, the ways in which we engage with that technology is just a lot different. And in, in the early years, it wasn't actually as reliable as a landline. But there were all sorts of different social factors that changed at the same time. So potentially there's room for people to adjust to a new reality in energy or in transportation as well. Yeah, the the slight difference is that, you know, the environmental impacts of that is what we call a public good. And so if we change our habits, the benefits flow to everyone, only a little bit to us. Whereas the fancy new communication devices, those are exciting and fun. We harvest all the benefit of that and enjoy those. So Doing that is is fun. Kind of doing something for the good of everyone else is altruistic, but sometimes we're a little bit lazy on those. I think we can see potential innovations that could help in terms of gadgets. I think there are a lot of people who get really excited about their electric cars, um, and there are a lot of people who get excited about their solar panels. I have both. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've I've actually been excited about my electric car. It's a lot of fun. The acceleration is fantastic. It's just smooth. I do drive a long way every weekend in the dead of winter, (laughs) and the battery runs out before I get there, so I have to stop and do some fast charging along the way. You know, it it did take a lot of figuring out how to make it work, right? The first time I drove up to Maine where I have a house, I got there and said, I'm going to plug this in, and hopefully it'll be recharged by the time I'm ready to go back at the end of the weekend, and it said by 4 p.m., It just didn't say 4 p.m. what day. (laughs) Uh, It was going to be 4 p.m. on Tuesday. (laughs) So uh, I needed to install a fast charger up there, a faster charger, so I could get it charged. And then I'm still, I'm the chair of my condo association electrical vehicle charging committee because we're trying to figure out how we can get EV charging in our building. You know, the building is kind of old, so the power lines aren't up to snuff and a whole bunch of issues. So we've been working on that for two years. Fortunately, MIT offers EV charging here, uh, and I'm able to uh, mostly fill up here and then up in my place in Maine, which is powered by PVs. So (laughs) I'm trying to do my best to kind of actually walk the walk that I've been talking for 40 years. But we clearly need policies that make things easier to do that. Subsidies for PVs, infrastructure for charging, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, in the North, I mean, that is the infrastructure for charging. There's been a big commitment in the Northeast now to get that in. So you got to get over that hump. And then once you're over that hump, I think it gets easier and easier. In these early stages, it is kind of a making sure you're searching for, is there someplace near that you can charge? But soon there will be past that. And then I think this, this, the fast charging is getting faster and faster. So the technology thing will help it as well. And transportation is a huge source of air pollution. So that will have substantial benefits inside cities, which could actually address some of the inequality issues as well. Yeah, I think getting, I mean, so the electric vehicles on conventional air pollution are probably even more important than on climate change, but that would kill those two birds with one stone if we go that direction. So I think what I would say is that the energy mix, if we're serious about climate change, the energy mix in the next 20 to 30 years has to be really dramatically different. And that's going to mean a lot of changes for both our environment, but also for where people get their energy and what they're doing with it. Yeah, I would encourage, you know, pioneers. 
to try some of these new things and be a leader in your neighborhood. I think one of the things that prevents us from moving ahead is people just don't, it's hard to see doing something a different way. And if you're used to doing the thing the same way, using the same fuels and the same technologies, you don't really want to change. And people are busy. Everyone's got a busy life and it's hard to put a lot of energy on, uh, mental energy on doing something different in the way you use energy. But if you're up for it and you're a pioneer and can kind of demonstrate some of these things, then maybe your neighbor, you can, you'll talk to your neighbors and, and say, Hey, this was actually kind of fun. It was interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't as bad as I thought. There were a few kinks when I got started, but those have been ironed out. So you should really give this a shot. And also the role of being an engaged citizen as well and thinking about how to push people who are in elected office to think about different groups of people and how they benefit or harm from different policies, how to think about people in future generations and really prioritize what it's going to take to make changes that are going to protect the climate. And vote. (laughs) Yes. The energy mix in the future will depend on what types of energy we need. You know, there's liquid fuels, there's gas fuels, there's electricity and solid fuels. Some of those have unique uses in different things. Like one of the barriers to electric vehicles has been having batteries that are light enough, that can store enough electricity, and then they're slow to charge. You only have to spend a couple of minutes filling up your car with gas. It's very dense and you can go a long way. So getting over some of those barriers are really critical So if you can get over those barriers, then a lot more electricity. If you can't get over those barriers, then maybe it's a liquid fuel, but maybe from a different source, maybe from biofuels. So from an economic standpoint, we'd like to let the market kind of sort out which is the best option, given this very complex system. That's why we'd like a broad carbon price that would let things turn out the way that makes most economic sense rather than target a specific mix. But that mix has to have a lot less fossil fuels, or possibly none, or we need to have carbon capture and storage with the fossil fuels we use. Right. So from a science perspective, you want to get to zero carbon. And when I think about how these transitions will go, I really think about how different kinds of energy transitions and other kinds of transitions have happened in the past. And what we see is it's they haven't been smooth. They haven't been just incremental. And it's hard to say what the winners and losers are going to be in terms of technologies. Uh, but setting the right conditions for those transitions to happen and making sure they happen in a in a just way that benefits everyone and not just certain people is important. Yeah, the electricity sector has been kind of interesting. There's been these waves of different things that have come in and then they've been replaced by something else. Uh, you know, for example, we had a lot of coal generation first. Well, early on, hydro. <laughs> you know, in the early days, we used we took hydropower and turned electricity, and then we needed more, and we have coal. And then in the 60s and 70s, we thought nuclear power was the answer. So you had a massive amount of nuclear power built in those years, and then with safety issues involving that, that kind of came to a halt. Then we had a lot of gas generation built. And so it's been kind of wave on wave. And the nuclear power one started, but then stopped, choked off. Uh, so when we've looked at some studies of of uh, wind and solar, we see that you could get to maybe 40% of U.S. electricity supply with wind and solar, where it would still match well with the patterns of demand. If you get up past that, that's when you start running into this need for storage or demand management, or other sorts of things, which ends up making it more costly. And then you're looking for maybe another another baseload sort of power, like, like nuclear or something. What's your current project, Noel? What are you working on right now? Well, actually, one of the one of the projects we're starting out is is actually thinking about the nuclear idea. And well, we have a lot of nuclear power plants that are ramping down or aging out of the fleet. And We're looking at what happens to air quality depending on what you substitute that with. There are a couple of different pathways. You could go and substitute for the nuclear power generation with fossil fuels, or you could substitute it for renewables. And I think while many have looked at the CO2 implications of that, the air quality implications will depend on where and when those fossil fuels or renewables come online, where they're located. And if we can think about 
this transition a little bit better, potentially we can get decision makers at the state level to think about the implications of putting more fossil fuels in the system and figure out how the costs and benefits work out. Cool. You know, we just completed a little study on nuclear power role versus v- v- v renewables, and we had kind of nuclear power uh, gradually, you know, closing down, and then you'd have to replace it with something else. We didn't think too much. Well, we let economics determine that. But one of the things we want to kind of do as a follow up on that is what if we extended the license of those nuclear power plants? Would that then how much would that might save the system if we didn't have to build all new new power plants? So it's it's funny that even though we haven't talked about this, we're kind of working down the same direction. Yeah, and and as we think about scenarios, we want to be conscious of involving policymakers as well and what they're thinking about. And a lot of the decisions that are getting made are, you know, on the grid level, for example, and individual power producers, but also policymakers in different states who are setting renewable standards and companies that are investing in different energy sources. You know, we talked mostly about the U.S. and a little bit about China. There's a whole world out there. Uh, you know, there's big air pollution problems in lots of the parts of the world. Have you given much thought to that, or what should we be worrying about there? Well, we're hoping to get a, some more research started in India, which has some substantial air pollution problems and hasn't had as much regulation and activity and, and research as China historically. Uh, it's a big country, a lot of population and severe air pollution problems. I think we're starting to see air pollution measurements in a lot of different places and really understand how severe the problem is in a lot of developing cities. There are increasing amounts of low-cost sensors that can actually measure air pollution in places where we don't have an extensive monitoring network like we have in the U.S. and like there is in Europe. So it's a really dynamic field in thinking about what those sources are, and particularly intersecting with development. It's really important to think about how you provide energy to people in a way that is going to protect their health and make sure that it actually has a net benefit. Yeah, I think, you know, as, I, as we mentioned earlier, we had worked in China with Tsinghua University, and we actually, they visited us a while back and are trying to get going a project jointly with us, you know, in kind of suggesting that what made climate policy possible in China is that dual benefit of air pollution control and greenhouse gas control. And they would really like to help have us help take that lesson to other parts of the world. Because I think one of the things is there's 7 billion people in the world. What is it? 2 billion of them are in the U.S. and Western Europe and developed countries and the other 5 billion outside that. If they all consume energy like we do, uh, the world is going to be fried and air pollution will be awful. So we really have to jump them over the coal era, right? We have to skip that one uh, and go to something else. But, you know, we've had some discussions and we've had a, meetings in Africa and other places. And when they look around, they see the cheapest fuels are coal or are fossil fuels. But that's, again, only looking at this, you know, cheapest and not thinking about the air pollution effects. So I think we really have a lot of work we really need to do to bring this message that, you know, if you just look at what you pay for coal and and the cost of electricity, but aren't looking for what the other costs of it are, then you're going to think it's the cheapest thing. But when you start realizing you're going to have more hospitalizations and health care problems and sick children and asthma and other sorts of problems from air pollution, you really want to rethink that choice. So that you know that, that's a really powerful message, I think. And somehow we have to get together, Noel, Noel and do something about that. Well, we've, we've certainly, the, the work that we've done in the past together has really tried to link that and tried to say, well, what policymakers are concerned about is the economy. And if we can then think about what impacts those health effects have on economic productivity, then maybe we can speak the language that they understand. And I think that's that's a really powerful thing when we've actually quantified the impacts of air pollution on the economy as a percentage of GDP. That really gets a lot of people's attention. Yeah, I, mean, I think we were able to do that in Europe. We were able to do it in the United States. We were able to do it in China. But it is a it is trench warfare. <laughs> you know, it's fine for India if you've done it for China, but is it true in India? It's fine for, it's fine if you've done it in the United States, but is it true in Mexico City? It's fine if you've done it in Mexico City, but is it true in Santiago? So it's a big job. 
I hope we're up for it. <laughs> and and also getting at the level of detail that's really needed in terms of what specific policies can you put in place to make sure you get those benefits at the same time. Yeah, because they have to be relevant to the culture they're in, right? You know, one size doesn't fit all. Cities have different aspects. They're arranged differently, different transportation needs. You know, technologies can be used all over the world. Cell phones are used everywhere. But there are some relevant aspects of really knowing what's going on in the location. And so different that, legal and regulatory frameworks yeah. as well. And that's why I think, you know, the, the work we've done in China, we worked very closely with people in China and other places. So really, you know, we have some expertise, but we don't have all the expertise we need here. So some of these collaborations are really critical. Yeah, and I think that's the that's kind of the hallmark of a lot of the work that goes on in the joint program on science and policy of global change that actually engages some of the stakeholders to think about what they really need at the front end to think about how the research can be more useful and put into practice. Yeah, and that reminds me, you know, if you want to find out more about our program, it's, uh, what is it? <laughs> I've forgotten now. Globalchange.mit.edu. Yeah, and so that's the program, joint program that I run. But Noelle is an associated faculty with it, and a lot of her work is listed there. But do you have another site people can go to? Sure, you can uh, go to mit.edu slash Celine group. And also I'm on Twitter at Noelle Celine. Great. Well, you know, this is a lot of fun. You know, coincidentally, Noel, I've become an air pollution expert. I have, uh, for some reason, people read the articles I've written with you, and I've gotten a couple of uh, uh, high school students write in saying one student wanted to do a monitor air pollution and kind of say what is the average air pollution level in the fall in their in their city. You know, I should have sent them to you, but I looked online to see if you could buy air pollution monitors, and they were kind of expensive. And then they they don't really monitor ozone or a lot of the I think they do mainly the particulate matter. So I looked on my iPhone and I saw that I could actually every day it tells me what the air pollution levels are going to be in terms of PM two point five, PM ten, ozone, nitrates, a whole host of carbon monoxide. You know all the pollutants you know about. So I suggested they just track them on their phone. But I guess their science teacher told them that was not enough. <laughs> they wanted to actually buy a monitor and actually measure them. So they they went back on that. And then another young woman was wondering what she could do to solve air pollution, I actually suggested maybe they not mow their lawn. <laughs> I thought maybe that would be appealing, like do less work and you'll get a clean, cleaner air. Well, I'm starting to absorb the economics as well. I'm seeing the benefit of monetizing things to really communicate with policymakers in a language that they understand. Uh, so thinking about the, the costs and benefits in a more structured way and, and using more dollar signs. I think that's one of the fun things about the joint program and MIT more broadly is that the interaction we have across these different disciplines really enriches us. It's it's always interesting to think that you can just throw a few answers over the fence from your discipline to the other side, and they'll be able to pick them up and run with them and know what they're doing. But inevitably, I think we find that if you just throw those over the fence, people don't know what to do with them or don't understand some of the limits. So you really have to work together. Absolutely. Noelle, this was great. I'm glad you could make it for this conversation. Yeah, this uh, has I've, been fun. I've learned a lot from you over the years and probably a few things today. Yes, and hope it continues. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.